Hello, welcome everyone. Um, hello guys on YouTube. Um, I apologize for the brief uh, technical difficulties in the beginning. I hope you can all uh, uh, hear me well, see me well, see the presentation. Thank you very much to my lovely assistant. Um, what was your name again, sorry, please? Marilyn. Ma Marilyn. <laughs> Marilyn. The, the nervousness of the moment lets me uh, forget names within a, ten a couple of seconds. So now we, we have our second assistant. What, what, what was your name again? Kubov. Let's give them a random applause. <laughs> so the title of my presentation is um, The Power of State. I called it the most underrated element of modern language learning. Now, I hope you will see and understand why this one is uh, true and important for us as, as language learners, as polyglots, within the next 35 minutes. And I personally, I'm an engineer. Um, you can see this at the pattern of my shirt. <laughs> so I like patterns a lot, I like structure a lot. So what I did was, I put a matrix for my presentation. A three times three matrix, about three parts. So first state, why do we need that? What is it, the definition? The importance, conventional state shifters, which we all know from our daily lives. May I help you? Yeah, just Thank you. And then second, how to access state for optimized, efficient, and effective language learning. And the third part, how to apply these state shifters in different aspects of language learning, for example, when, language learning, when doing language learning ourselves, and as well as during communication with natives, other people, italki partners, and so on. So let's start with the definition of state. The simplest one is state means how we currently feel. Now another one is, for example, our way of being in the moment. And for the more scientific ones among us, I have a nice one here. State can be defined as the sum of the millions of neurological processes happening within us. So the word state has been used a lot uh, in the field of NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming. And I would like to give three examples from very different areas where state is at least one significant element of, of these situations. Now the first element uh, is here, you can see Pavlov's dog. And I'm sure you, you've heard from Pavlov, he did the experiments where he fe fed the dog and then he rang the bell at the same time. And uh, after a while the dog started salivating when the dog just heard the bell. So what Pavlov did was classic conditioning. He put an anchor and the dog when he heard the bell, he thought, okay, I'm gonna get food. Salivation is a good idea. So the state of the dog shifted to a state of being eager to eat. Now a second example comes from people in classical performance. For example here, Bruce Springsteen, and they did an interview with him about stage anxiety. And what he answered was that even after decades of being on stage, of playing, performing, music in front of stadiums, 50,000 people and more. He still um, has the same physiological uh, conditions that other people have um, with, with, um, during other circumstances. So increased heart rate, um, differences in the breathing and um, hands shaking and so on. But the thing here, he as a professional is aware that this is the state for him, this is the state of performance in front of a stage. So he has accepted that, and he has found a level of those physiological parameters so that it's okay for him, it's not too much, it's not too little, that's just, like he says, he knows he's pumped and ready to play. Now, the third example you can see here. On this picture, we have two um, very relevant people for us polyglots. Uh, one of them is Lydia Machova, uh, who we all got to know and love during the uh, last couple of days and weeks, if not earlier. And the other person is uh, Anthony Robbins. Now, Anthony Robbins is a master in eliciting high performance state in a lot of people. The quote that you see on this picture, yes. So it's actually, before taking action, he recommends you get into the right state. So for example, when you do language learning, get into the right state first. And 
the other two people in the picture, uh, they are interpreters, so they are not that uh, relevant for us polyglots, but I'm sure they are very awesome people too. You're welcome. <laughs> so we could say before we do something, we change the state. Now on the other hand, also doing something changes our state. And basically, why are we doing something anyway? The human being, so we are doing things mostly because we want to change the way how we feel. Now, let's have a brief look on the different states that human beings can experience in an everyday life. There are states like excitement, joy, sexual arousal, belief, on the other hand, anger, sadness, confusion, fear, and so on. And I put them on two different columns. Now, this is not to judge any of them. Those states exist for a number of reasons, and we can assume that they are having very useful functions for specific situations. What we can say, though, some of them are more useful in certain situations than others. So what I want to talk about today is how to choose the most useful states for language learning. A little bit additional information. So many of those states can also be measured with a scientific and technological uh, means. For example, you could measure the the state of a person, at least to some extent, by looking at the parameters like blood pressure, the color of the skin of a person, uh, the body tension, heart rate, and so on and so forth. And very often the state is, of course, a combination of all these factors. Now the next step is a little demonstration of that we as humans are able of shifting states almost instantaneously. So Elisa and I, let's assume we're having a little fight. Why did you call last night? What do you mean? Yeah, so you said you would call. I, I said I'd call you. Yes, you no, haven't. No, I, I didn't promise anything. You have. No, it's, yes. the, it's the same like last week. You yeah. know when your mother came to visit? Yeah. You didn't speak to me the whole weekend, and I fed your cat. Yeah, <laughs> my cat almost died because of you. you what? Know that. I fed her five times a day. A day? No, I don't think so. <laughs> oh shit, that's my boss. <laughs> Hello, boss. Uh, yeah, no, no, no it's, it's all right. I'm presenting in one of, in front of 150 people, but uh, it's okay. Yeah, it's no <laughs> matter. Oh, that talk. Yeah, no, no, I, now it's, it's okay. I can send it to you yeah, right now. Wait a second. Okay, yeah, you got it. Thanks. Bye. Okay. So, the point here was I'm sure that most of you, now it's actually switched off. I'm sure that most of you are uh, familiar with one of those situations, either from an experience from yourself, or you've um, experienced it when, when being part in a communication with somebody else. Now, first of all, let's um, thank you to Miroslav for calling me, and thank you for Elisa for um, this wonderful performance. Let's give them a random applause. Thank you very much. Now, what are established state changes that we use as human beings in everyday life? Very classical ones include nutrition, music. So I'm sure if somebody listens to a relaxing piece of a Mozart sonata or um, some meditation music, this person will probably have a different state than after listening to heavy metal for half an hour. Other state changes include meditation, hypnosis, we are also triggered to some extent by optical appearances, especially men sometimes, kinesthetic touches, and so on. Now, some of them are in the short run, some of them are in the medium run, but um, the question is, which of them can we use to our own um, better performance? And with that one, I would like to come to the second part of my talk, how to actually access state. Now, I'm starting this part with a brief introduction of my book, Smile Talk Cheesecake, 
that I published last autumn. And it includes uh, 13 interviews with uh, known polyglots like Lydia Machova, Lindsay Williams, uh, Gabriel Weiner, and so on. And it also includes 45 proven exercises, 44, 44 uh, proven exercises that you can use in your uh, daily language learning experience in order to, uh, to improve your performance. And why is this um, relevant to us? Because when I started the, um, the when I started the, the research for the book, I, I interviewed a lot of language learners and I asked them, also non-polyglots, what is it that kept most people from language learning? And here I came up with um, excuses that are usually fitting within a certain categories. So one of them is, for example, I'm too stupid, I'm too old, I'm even too stupid to write stupid correctly. <laughs> I don't have enough hair. I have enough hair, but at the wrong parts of my body. <laughs> I'm not Richard. <laughs> wow. I'm not the person speaking 35 languages. Well, that's the reason. I'm not Lydia. I'm not Alex. I'm not Judith. I'm not Michael. You see what the point is with this one? The point is we have 400 awesome polyglots on this conference, on this gathering. So at some point, chances are very high that you will actually meet somebody that has your name. My hamster has a migraine. I love that one. It's, it's the excuse for anything. <laughs> and then we have one. People are always replying in English to me. Now that one I most definitely accept. And I can promise you one thing. At the end of this talk, we will also talk about how to challenge the holy grail of, for us polyglots, the, the holy question, how to act and how to, what to do when a person replies in English. So, these examples were basically examples for internal communication. We are communicating with ourselves every day in a thousand different ways. So, for example, we have thoughts, we have internal dialogues, and the way we communicate, so either by rewarding ourselves for good things or by punishing, I intentionally crossed that one out, well, that makes a kind of a difference because our body usually responds to what we, what we tell it to do. So if you take one thing from this talk, I really, really kindly invite you to talk positively to yourself. It really makes a difference. If somebody talks to yourself, if, if somebody speaks like, ha, huh, my pronunciation is so bad, my Slovak is getting worse and worse every day even though I'm studying an hour, <laughs> and, and I will never be as good as Richard. And then, <laughs> where will I get? It's like, I can hit the wall. But on the other hand, if I start like, hmm, well, my slogan is certainly not perfect, but I mean, if I take action, there is so and so much chance that I will get closer and closer and closer to your door. Better not? Or if I will lost the battery, it's, it's, the it's battery off. Is dying. It's off, it's dying. Um, do we have a chance, or shall I continue speaking without the microphone? Is that okay? Maybe some battery, but I cannot stuck on the on the cable. Well, let's let's keep it up. Awesome polyglots at this gathering, and 
I think Lydia posted something like the median of the number of languages that are spoken by a person here at the gathering is six. So, six languages per person. I mean, imagine that one, yeah, be proud of that. Whether, whether you speak one or 35. But we are like the, the polyglot group in the world. And most people out there, they would be happy speaking three, right? So. <laughs> So, I would call them positive reinforcing beliefs. And three simple examples. I'm a very talented language learner. Well, as we just um, mentioned, that's certainly true. My pronunciation is getting better and better every day. And learning language X gets easier and easier every day. Because there are so, so many things to learn in that language. And when you study, then you come closer to that part. So it gets easier every day. The more vocabulary, the more words you know, the less words there are in the random text that you don't know yet, right? So, what I suggest to you is the following exercise. Write down five to ten positive reinforcing beliefs about your language learning endeavor. Anything like that one I've said before, and feel free to add your own individual ones for your own specific goals. Then print it down on a piece of paper, and in the morning when getting up, stand in front of the mirror, and actually read that out to the mirror. But read it to yourself, so you look yourself into the eyes. Look yourself into the eyes and read it out. And then there are two things will happen. First of all, it's the test about your current belief system. So as surprising as this might sound, when you look into your eyes, some people, um, it's, it's not often, a, it's often challenging actually doing that, especially when it challenges a belief that, that somebody currently might have. So if somebody has like the belief, oh, I'm such a bad language learner, this person might have difficulties in actually reading that out in the mirror. So it's a test about your current belief system. And secondly, you train your belief system, system in a positive way. So once you do this every day for a couple of days, weeks, and months, you will see to start seeing progress about your belief system and consequently also about your performance as a language learner. Now the next topic of my talk is anchorage. And as a brief introduction, basically, human beings, we have different types of anchoring, visual, auditory, we had that one we published before, kinesthetic, and what I would like to show you is how to anchor a state by pressing a button on your hand. Now for this one, we take a look at that picture again, and may I ask for a moment, how many of you have realized that was actually pressing a button on my hand here in the picture? May I see your hand? Anybody? Yeah. So, this was the moment when my parents took a picture of me when opening the, bo book, uh, the box with the first printed version of my book. So it was a very emotionally moving um, point in my life. And what I thought, okay, that feels so awesome. Uh, I want to keep the state. So what I did was I pressed that button here. and. Um, even now that I'm performing in front of 150 people, um, you might see, start seeing me smiling, but it's like, I can't help it. It's such a strong anchor that, uh, oh, like, oh, now it feels too good. Uh, <laughs> so it's, it's so strong, and you can do the same. Like, think about it. When you have a successful interaction with somebody, when you have, for the first time, learned the first 500, 1,000 books, when you have for the first time read the, the first page of Dostoevsky or whatever you call it language learning is. That feels awesome, right? So take the, the moment, keep the safe, and then press the anchor because there are always sometimes more challenging times ahead than maybe the second page of Dostoevsky. Maybe not that easy, like the second one more. You know, you know what I'm talking about. So. Oh, we got that one back, so I have to adjust my voice for a little bit. The next topic here is the comfort zone. Is that right now with the voice? Perfect, thank you. A very famous picture about comfort zone is basically you have a circle containing the word comfort zone. And then you have the area outside the comfort zone. And then some people are saying that's where the magic happens. So what I'm suggesting is to modify that picture a little bit and call it high-performance state. 
So again, we have the comfort zone. And of course, if the comfort zone is within a circle, or um, in that case, a lip suite, then there is, this, of course, an area outside the comfort zone. But what I'm suggesting here is that you call the area close to the boundary performance zone. So what do I mean by that one? Is, of course, like um, we need to grow by training ourselves, by learning vocabulary or grammar or whatever that is, by doing things that we haven't done yet, by doing things that are yet out of our comfort zone. Now, for example, from sports, if, if I start doing, doing push-ups or an exercise, maybe on the first day I might be able to do one or two or ten or whatever. And if I'm starting training right now, then I, I wouldn't start with doing 500 on the first day, right? And this one is... The point here is you want to access that zone where it's just challenging enough. And how do we actually do that? So I will demonstrate this here with these uh, juggling balls. Let's assume a situation. Let's say I'm coming home after uh, an exhausting day at work or whatever, and it's like, ah, I'm tired, mm, but I should study whatever. Um, German grammar, well, I'm a German native speaker, so thanks God, no. But uh, let's, let's assume some, some challenging task in language learning. Now, in a state like um, very tired and so on, it's, it's maybe not that easy to actually do that. Now, what I'm suggesting here is to engage in a physical activity, so something else, and not, connect, not necessarily connected to the brain, engaging different areas in the brain. That's, that's the uh, right way to say it. So, I start juggling, and let's see, yeah, I can try doing this, and it's maybe, I don't know, is it maybe too challenging for me juggling 150 people? I don't know. It kind of works. Uh, can I also speak uh, Slovak while doing this? Učim sa po slovenski, pretože mam rad. Thank you very much. The point here was not how many balls can I juggle with, how many Slovak words can I say. Uh, there are awesome jugglers out there. Thank you very much to, to Wout, wow, he showed me some tricks yesterday, so maybe why it actually worked, it has never worked before. Um, so, oh okay, thank you very much. So it, it doesn't matter if you juggle with one ball, or with three balls, or with five burning knives, or whatever crazy stuff is out there. The point here is that you find the area that is just about in your performance zone, yeah? So, let's say in my case, maybe it's, it's maybe juggling with two balls. Yeah, it's okay. It's also okay with one. Doesn't matter, yeah? You're at home studying languages, nobody cares. <laughs> Throw the ball from one hand to the other. Yeah? If, if, if that puts you in a performance zone, that's totally fair. And then I can start... Uh, re wow, that was a bad idea. Um, then I can start um, remembering words like Moi lidi, moi pieši projekt je o tom, ako se komunuje, bla bla bla. So what, what, so what am I doing here? It's, let's say you study um, phrases or vocabulary and so on, and then during the, uh, at home, when, when, oh, okay, hold on. So let's say we are studying, yeah? and at home it might feel fine, right? We know how to say it good. But then we, we go on the street, then we talk to, to, um, to somebody. So for example, I was in, in, in Russia uh, for the first time in my life, and I wanted to order fish tea. Now there was a long queue, and uh, everybody was just saying the number, yeah? So, bosem, tinatsad, whatever, pet, piat, mixing up Slovak and Russian, yes. Um, so, once I was there, I, I talked to the, to the lady, I said, Piat Natsa, Pajasta. Okay. And, and she was like, huh? And I was like, again, yeah, Piat Natsa. And she was like, eh? <laughs> and I was started sweating because there were 50 people behind me, I was like, what is this guy doing? And I was like, Piat Natsa. And she was like, ah, Piat Natsa. <laughs> <laughs> so the point here is, I, I did not stress the right syllable of the word Piat Natsa, so she, 
said, well, we can't do that, so whatever. <laughs> but at least on the third time I got it right, and um, that was definitely an enlargement of my comfort zone. Now, for being able to perform in such a situation, for, for feeling cool and so on, it, it might have been useful, back then I didn't know that exercise, uh, of performing the, the numbers of Russian by juggling, because that is a, an, an additional task. Yeah? So as an engineer, I would, I would tell you, uh, See it as an extra input on the CPU, let's say the juggling engages the CPU by 50% and then you add 70% um, from the language learning which makes it 120% CPU overload. That's good, yeah? That's like getting into the performance zone. Now let's come to the third part of my presentation. The third part of my presentation is how to use those state shifters that we, we have now been talking about uh, for language learning. The first part is a learning state. So that one is very simple. It's basically using some of the exercises, some of the state shifters from before, before starting to learn. Now the second part is taking a step back when looking at mistakes and not being there yet. So this one is a graph from my book. And you see on the y-axis the progress of your goal. And on the x-axis, the weeks that have passed during the language learning. Now, in conventional goal setting, you would say that you would assume a linear progress, right? So the planned progress is, is linear, but the actual curve is always nonlinear. And let's take a look at the square about uh, at about week four. So what we see here is the linear progress in week four is from about 40% of the goal reached to about 46%. However, the actual progress of this example is from 42 to 44. And if you look closely, you see from day four to day six, it actually decreases a bit there. Yeah? There might be some confusion. Confusion usually happens before big realizations and so on. So if somebody is really focused on like, uh, day by day progress and it's like, nah, I'm getting worse and worse and worse. However, once you step out of the picture, you can do two things. Yeah, so so what, what I'm suggesting here is taking a step out of, of the whole topic and let's say, okay, so let's, let's look at the language learning, learner Michael over there. What is it that he actually needs? Yeah, you, that's called, in NLP, it's called triple position. So you step out of progress, you talk about yourself in a third person. So that person there, Michael, what does he need to progress? And then some thoughts will arise, like whatever, better pronunciation, more vocabulary, and so on and so forth. And then you will also start judging, quote unquote, or looking at your own progress in a more neutral way. Yeah, not, not so emotionally connected, not so like, eh. and makes it a bit clearer um, from a, let's say, anonymous point of view, what is it that you currently need to progress. And there is a second one, it's actually called the second position, which is very nice as well. So you put yourself in the position of the native, so the native talking to you, the native talking to Michael right now, so I'm maybe the person in Russia, the lady selling the pishki, and I'm like, hmm, well, this guy, he's doing fine. He, he takes the effort coming to Russia, learning Russian and so on and so forth. But it was just a little bit the pronunciation of the word Pjatnazat that he would have needed to adjust, right? So that feels much better than like being here and it's like, ah, they didn't get me, my pronunciation was so bad, I'm never gonna speak a word of Russian again, right? And a very nice example that I, um, got the idea of yesterday when talking to, um, to Mr. Everson, uh, thank you very much for the suggestion, is that you can also look that progress sometimes happens um, in, in two different ways, or there are two different extremes. So an engineering example, for example, there are two different, two main types of aircrafts. We have uh, airplanes, which are basically mm, generating a lifting force by accelerating during takeoff, but there is nothing happen on, in uh, the vertical direction. They're just moving horizontally, getting faster, 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 until they eventually are taking off. Yeah. And nobody ever questions that when at an airport because it's so natural to us. Yeah. And 
the second type is a helicopter. So the helicopter is stable like it is, and it starts rotating, and at some point it goes up or, um, vertically. Now those are the two extre extremes in language learning. Some people are seeing progress. So for example, I'm a person, I'm seeing the progress step by step. Yeah? If, if I'm, I'm writing down what I'm doing, and then I compare it to what happened a couple of days ago, and I'm usually able to see progress day by day. Now, on the other hand, I also know very good polyglots. Um, for example, Juan Borges, he's, he's the first one on the interview in, in, in my book. He's a person that he does something, and then suddenly there is like a unit step function that it doesn't know when it happens, but eventually there is like a unit step function, and then suddenly he can do something. Yeah? So, so that's different um, ways of being a genius, being a professional, being a sophisticated language learner. Two minutes. So let's, let's tackle the holy grail of, of polyglotism. What to do when, they, when the person replies in English? We need three elements for that one. First is being in the right state. Now we have talked about that one. The second one is conscious information. We'll handle that one in a minute. And the third one is a concept called rapport. Now in order to explain what rapport is, what rapport is I want to introduce you to my grandfather. So he was a very passionate polyglot himself. Um, he died a couple of months after this picture was taken. But uh, at that moment of time, he's, he's very proud of me. I hope he still is when looking down at us from somewhere up there. But uh, the, the scenery here is that I was 18 and I had just received the first certificate, uh, the CEE, the C1 in English. So um, my first uh, achievement in, in, in language learning. And why is this relevant to us? It's relevant because of that one. So that is an example of rapport. Rapport means being on the same wavelength. Now you can see many different, many things here. One is both persons on this picture are totally in their own world. This picture was taken a couple of minutes later and we were both thinking of whatever it was, but um, in our own world. However, we had almost the same body language. So you see the arms are the same, the fingers are touching uh, the lips, uh, we have a little bit of difference here at the legs and uh, the position of our right hands. So it's, it's deep rapport, however, still individual and the personal. Now you want to achieve that one at an unconscious level because this one was unconscious. That's important. It was not staged. And in the optimal situation, you achieve that level of rapport when talking to a native. Now, how can you do that? Um, for example, Benny Lewis called it walking like an Egyptian. Yeah? So things like body language, you know, like Italians, they're always speaking with the hands. Adapting the speed of your talking to the native you're talking to. And the third element is conscious information. Now, for this one, I would like to play a brief example, 20 seconds, from a talk I had with a girl in our park, around the corner here, um, after learning Slovak for 17 seconds. So that one was a couple of weeks ago. Let's see if that works. Prebačite, prosim. Učim se po slovenski. Možete sa mnou minutko hovori? Može. Ďakujem, veľmi pekne. Ako sa voláte? Teresa. Teresa. Teži ma, som Michael. Hej. Good. Thank you. So the, to, ask, to answer the two most important questions here. Yes, she was hot. The second one. The second one, no, I did not get her phone number. But she works in our park, so maybe she's still there. This, this conversation continued for about a minute afterwards. And what, what did I do here? Let's look a bit more closely. So I, I promised you we, we talk about conscious information that is relevant for high performance state when interacting with natives. Now, the three core elements are here. Who are you? Yeah. There was a, a couple of discussions about should we talk to strangers? How should we talk to them? Well, they are persons to model. They are people to model. Yeah. So you can copy or imitate or 
learn from the way they are communicating. However, a random person is, of course, not our italki tutor or our tandem partner. That's a different story, of course. But what you can do is, you can, first of all, introduce yourself. So in this case, I'm saying, prebač te prosim, excuse me, please. I'm learning Slovak, učim sa poslovenski. So with this one, at that point of time in the shopping center, the essential information is, I'm a random person, I'm learning Slovak. Okay. She says yes, with a question mark. So it's actually like, maybe she thinks, okay, that's interesting, a person learning Slovak, why is not that many people learning Slovak these days? So let's see what happens. Second one, možete da sam no, minutko hovorit. Can you speak to me for a minute? Essential information, what do you want? I want to speak Slovak to you. And third, how long does it take? Because this person has her own life as well, right? So I'm occupying her time, occupying her life. She wants to know, okay, I'm open to helping you. How long will it take? And then the, um, the conversation can continue with, with whatever topic you might want to choose. Now, let's summarize briefly what we had today. We had state, why isn't important? State is our way of being in the moment. It's important because we are always in a certain state. And I highly suggest to you to train with the exercise and do research on this topic in order to be able to generate more useful states for whatever your goal you might have. We talked a little bit about conventional state shifters. We saw the performance with the high performance state, for example, juggling. What you can also do, I've seen many people are, are playing instruments here, playing very simple pieces or like scales on the piano, on the violin and so on. Also very good to engage a certain part of your CPO, of your brain. And then while playing scale on the piano, I can repeat words or sentences at the same time. We talked about anchoring, that's a nice one. Internal communication, please take that one as a take home message. And we learned how to apply that for the language learning, for interacting with natives, and how to feel comfortable with so-called mistakes, and also be nice to yourself about your level of progress. Thank you very much. Are there any questions, and who asks the first one? Yes, please. Well, that's a simplification, of course. Uh, oh, yeah, sorry. Thank you very much. So, if I got your question correctly, is like, what is the connection between high performance state and CPU overload? Yes. Okay. Now, that's a simplification. That's an analogy for getting an um, example. The point here is um, increasing the comfort zone. So, if you if you expand your comfort zone, so let's say like in case the CPU, your comfort zone is 100%. Now you train to expand your comfort zone to 105, 110, 120% of your current comfort zone. And for this one, you want to have high performance state for that kind of training. Yeah. It's like training a muscle. So like this, uh, I don't want to train, then doing push-ups, how many will I get? But it's like, hmm, myself in the right state. Yeah, I'm awesome, I can do it. I, I have that and that goal, okay, warming up and then doing the exercise. Is that answering your question? So being more, making yourself more comfortable helps you perform better? Making yourself more comfortable definitely makes your performance better. I even suggest adding other useful states to that one, yeah? So being comfortable with the uncomfortable is a very good start. And you can add what, whatever you, you need for, for being in the moment best. At, at any state that feels comfortable and useful to you for that endeavor. That's good. So the question is, would the juggling take away concentration from the, from the language learning? Yeah. Well, the point is, at some point you will, you will be out there in nature, right, uh, talking to a native, and then it's not like, okay, wait, I need to structure a sentence, I need a subject, and then I need a verb, and I need it in the sixth case, the subject, because it's Slovak and it's crazy and whatever. Uh, it, it's communication in, in the natural world, in outside world, it's, it's happening 99% unconsciously. Now, of course, I can t tell my italki part, or I can tell the person, or whatever the topic might be. Can you talk to me about that topic? But after that moment, you start to um, create 
the sentences at an unconscious level. Like the same I'm speaking right now. Of course, I've prepared for this talk, I've trained it. However, the sentences are always generated in my brain at an unconscious level because the way we speak is simply so fast that it's not possible um, consciously putting that together in, a um, uh, in, in, in the brain. Of course, in training, but not in real life. And to answer your question, um, juggling helps you uh, doing this at the same time because in the real communication there is always also other things going on that are like a little bit distractive so in that way th does the answer make sense to you yeah it does thank you very much so about the high performance so you presented with a juggling is it can be done with ever, something else i don't know like doing exercise or i don't know washing dishes driving and also i wanted to clarify in the beginning you said there's a lot of Anchors uh, also can be, and also you said um, about uh, the objects, and you s actually mentioned that men can focus on this one. It was a joke, or was a factual thing? <laughs> Sorry, just to clarify. Okay, step by step, it's been a long day for me too. Yeah. Uh, the first question was, can you use it with other things too, right? Okay, good. Yes, of course, I highly suggest that you add whatever is, is good for you. Of course, I'm, for example, I, I'm doing it while doing exercise, yeah? I can do exercise, and then even the exercise is more fun, right? If I'm, um, when I, I, learned, I learned Slovak for this gathering, and I was doing exercise, I had my fitness program, and at the same time I was listening to, to Slovak songs on YouTube, make your, make your own playlist, and then both activities are more fun, because you combine it, and then you engage different brain regions, and when engaging different brain regions at the same time, usually makes the performance and the experience better. Mm -hmm. Is that okay? Yeah. And the second part? I was say in the beginning when you presented different uh, um, triggers, <laughs> Anchors, uh, triggers, yeah. Anchors. You said you had like slightly mentioned the phrase that men are more slightly for something, and I was thinking, is it a joke or is it a factual thing? Because for me, it's always interesting. Okay. The gender, like perspective. Of course. Whether it's joke or whether it's factual thing. Well, in in that case, it was more mentioned as a joke. Okay. However, um, I'm well. That's a sensitive topic. I'm I'm 100% in favor of each sex, each gender having every opportunity and possibility in, in our everyday world. Mm -hmm. However, I would also acknowledge the differences of each gender. Mm -hmm. yeah? And in this case, then, this joke has a, has a true element. In attraction, of course, men are sometimes more prone to being attracted by certain visual triggers. Okay, yeah. so Fair enough. It probably depends on your background and whatever person. Yeah, okay. No, no. Yes. Has this on? Okay, good. Yes, up there, please. Mm -hmm. I actually have been juggling and someone uh, told me to, well, try and learn Hebrew while juggling and although it was harder to, to learn at that moment, after the juggling stopped, I was able to fully um, reproduce the two words, the... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> It is definitely possible, and it does not take away too much, and you will be able to also reproduce it under stressful circumstances. Thank you very much, Wout. He is the juggling master of this gathering. He taught me yesterday how to juggle with three balls. Thank you very much. Shall we call it a day? Thank you very much. Thank you.